What is up, a mouthful of history? We are back. Season 2, Episode 3. We we got something amazing in store for you, but it's been a while. It's nice to be back in person, y'all. Uh, we, before, were recording remotely, which was fine, I suppose, but being able to see Nick and Cameron next to me is nice, just in and of itself, but also because when you talk over a Zoom meeting... There's always those delays, and so I might start saying something, Cameron starts saying something, and it's just awkward, whereas here, we can kind of go off of each other's energy, for lack of a better way of putting it. You have body language, cues, we're not like lining up and raising hands in the Zoom call. Yeah. It's it's way more organic than over internet. (laughs) Exactly. So it is nice to be back. So, Nick, how you doing? I'm all right. Um, I know you guys want a little bit more than that. So, um, yeah, we were gone for a while and there are a multitude of reasons why it kind of starts, um, with, uh, my dog was, we were, I was taking her for a walk and she was attacked by another dog, which by the way, PSA, uh, keep your fucking dog on their leash. God damn it. I don't know who needs to hear that, but please. But just in case someone does need to hear it. So after that, we had to take care of her. Um, she's doing fine now. And then after that, we moved and then one of us got married. Who was it? Who got married? David got married. Oh yeah, that's right. I thought something happened important recently. So that's kind of the abridged version of why it's taking so long. On top of that, we did record this episode pre previously, but it, um, it really, sounded bad <laughs> and, and the and the fact that all of us are vaccinated we kind of just told ourselves why not we just record these in person and it is finally happened we are all here all healthy all happy and all good to go so shall we do it let's cue the music caroline fuck andrew jackson fuck andrew jackson fuck andrew jackson <laughs> It's There's like nothing better. There's no bigger middle finger. Hey, you want to put me in suicide mission? Okay, I'm just going to keep living. He clearly figured out how to go super sane. He wanted smelling dead, but he just he just wouldn't die. He was anti-bank, anti-paper money, and he's on the $20 bill. Nico just comes out of nowhere and soars across the sky. And welcome back to A Mouthful of History. I'm Nick. As always, join with me, David. Hey, everyone. Good to see you all in person again. And Cameron. How you doing, everyone? It's good to be back here with everyone just recording in person. What a time to be alive. Yeah. So we had recorded this episode months ago on Zoom with all of its delays. It didn't sound good. And then, of course, some of the audio got lost. So we just decided that we would record it once we could meet up in person again, which we can now do. So I'm going to kick it over to Cameron, who is going to set us up for the episode. So we decided to do the Battle of Algiers, our last movie review of the previous season. As we were discussing over ideas, we might as well have just done the entire Algerian War and Independence to go over the entire thing. Why not add on top of that? So this was my idea. And with the Algerian War of Independence, it's often overlooked in the grand scheme of things of revolution independence movements and it was probably the bloodiest of any independence movement how many years it was it was about eight years and so we're going to dive in we're going to talk background of the conflict you know the french colonization of algeria native peoples the berbers the arabs european settlers the pa noir we're going to talk about the beginnings of the independence movement going to talk about the creation of the FLN, and we're going to get into the war itself. So, let's take it from the top. France, like any other Western European country, wanted to have some colonies. It was very hot at the time. 
It was the thing to do. Power meant having more colonies. Yeah, once Europe was no longer turned in on itself, trying to fight like the Napoleonic Wars, it decided to spread out. Well, it's just they wanted to try to regain the prestige they lost after the Napoleonic Wars in trying to restore power. So, and of course, not by, you know, respecting the rights or sovereignty or lives of other people around the world. You don't do that when it comes to colonies, though. You basically are... Getting your own colony is basically a nice way of telling other people, we don't think of you as human. Yep. Yeah, and so France decided, you know, let's not go halfway around the world to find colonies, which they did anyway, end of China. But they're like, let's go across the Mediterranean to Algeria. They thought we weren't going to be able to pretend like, you know, that French Canadian thing didn't work out. Yeah. And the thing is, for our listeners, there was no such thing as Algeria. It was groups of native indigenous Muslims, and you had populations of the native natives. You have the natives and the native natives, the the Berbers. And so, David, can you give us a background of the population, at least up to the the French colonization, even during that? Yeah, so basically North Africa has this really diverse array of different folks. There are the Berbers who, like Cameron said, were kind of the the native natives of the area, the people that had been there the longest. But there were also other groups, uh, predominantly the Arabs that had come in. And the general area itself was predominantly Muslim after the rise of Islam in the like early 600s. But there, again, is a diversity of different cultures, you know, and you have in North Africa kind of a blending of that culture with the sort of greater Arab uh, Muslim culture that had taken over a lot of the area. So, like anywhere else, you just have this blend of things. Yeah, and so France needed a reason to go to Algeria. We mean, and theoretically, they didn't have to because they were, oh, we were, we're the white European country. We can do whatever we want. But they felt like they needed to find a cast's belly. So, well, well, you know, it's funny. I know now technically with the geneva convention and the un and stuff like that you need an excuse to go into a country even though it's like only in theory it's more of a guideline than an actual rule but what was it back then like oh we need an excuse because it's not like england or prussia russia or any of those countries are gonna say like hey france you shouldn't be doing that they always i think a large part of what it is is they need a lie that helps them sleep at night Because if you think of the people in Africa or Vietnam or Nicaragua as fully human, then you're taking their resources, invading their land and controlling them. And that doesn't make sense. That is an awful thing to do. So you need to tell yourself that you're enlightening them. You need to tell yourself that you're bringing them opportunity, that you're Christianizing them. You need something to help you sleep at night. You need the white man's burden. Exactly. While you're conveniently, of course, getting rich off of it. Trademark. Yeah. Yeah. And so... The French used the reason of the Barbary pirates. Oh, North African pirates selling white Christians into slavery. We need to stop that, even though it was stopped a few years prior. Really, there was a problem over grain payments with the day, the leader of the Algerian area. In Algeria at this time, you know, the area which constitutes modern-day Algeria had gotten autonomous rights in the Ottoman Empire. So they go in, and they start to slowly colonize Algeria. And it wasn't without massacres. Never is. Never is. And diseases. But the thing is, the native population resisted right from the outset. And by 1880, over a million Algerians died because of the wars, the resistance, the massacres, the mistreatment, and the diseases. So you might be asking yourself, well, yeah, the French did this, but what happened after? Well, they started to claim that Algeria was France. This Sacre was, bleu. So this is a little further down the road, but over time, European settlers started to show up. Like you do. As with most, if not all, the colonies that Western European powers take. Like you have the Rhodesians in Rhodesia, you have the Afrikaners in South Africa. The Europeans had the Pinot Noir. <laughs> Don't oh, you mean a uh, Pied Noir? The Pied Noir, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we, so the, 
with literal wine with legs and feet to, uh, just <laughs> did, like it's no these <laughs> angry racist colonist bottles of like, wine look look at these bottles of pinot noir like walking around no so it wasn't far off from the point but pinot noir basically meant european settlers that started to colonize algeria and contrary to popular opinion it wasn't all the french there was spaniards there was italians there was maltese and i don't mean the dogs unfortunately and, uh, and so it was a hodgepodge of European settlers, but again, like the Rhodesians and the Afrikaners, they felt like they were the star Billy Sneeches for all the Dr. Seuss fans out there. They felt like they had the superior rights and to the French, they did. So over time, you know, the French started to rule militarily and essentially to summarize it all up, the settlers and the colonialists had the rights, the native population didn't. And over time, from the start of the conquest on even before the war of independence there were independence movements you have someone like masali Hajj, who was in paris who set up a communist party for algeria and saying that we can fight through the proper channels to achieve independence there were also bills that were wanting to pass even from um french people and so there was the bloom violet bill and david can you explain that a little bit yeah so the bloom violet bill introduced by people with those names. Really what the Bloom Violet Bill was, was an attempt at assimilation for the Algerians. Because with the resistance from Algerians, they kind of realized that they couldn't keep them as complete outsiders to the system. So what the bill did was it offered citizenship to Algerian Muslims but they did not have to renounce their rights as Muslims to gain citizenship, which had been the rule before. Now, there were two problems essentially from opposite sides with this bill. One was that it was basically limited to about 25,000 Muslims when there are about 6 million total in Algeria. The second problem was that the Pied Noir also protested it. One of them quoted as saying, that we will never tolerate than even in the smallest commune that an Arab might be the mayor. And just to kind of explain why they would say that real quick, the Pied Noir had a complicated relationship with the French themselves because the Pied Noir were the people that were, again, you know, in Algeria colonizing it for the French, but they kind of developed their own sort of identity, their own place in the hierarchy, right? And so they are around Algerians who they see as the enemy because, of course, they're occupying them and people don't like to be occupied, so they're not going to like the Pied Noir. Pied Noir are going to, in return, feel tense in relation to the native Algerians. So because of that, in a lot of ways, the Pied Noir were even more vicious against the native Algerians than the people in France. And this can kind of be seen as similar to, for example, the way the American colonists were often more brutal against the Native Americans than the British. Not because the British were enlightened or anything like that, but because the American colonists often saw themselves in more direct competition with the natives who are their neighbors that they're displacing than the British Crown did. So basically, going back to this Blum Violet bill, you have the native algerian people upset because the bill is just small potatoes it really is not meaningful to the vast majority of the algerians whereas on the other hand you have the pied noir very upset that you're giving any sort of rights to the algerians at all and so everyone's pissed off and the bill gets shot down yeah for the record for everyone out there the twenty-five thousand from six million would basically be the equivalent of the uh, U.S. saying, okay, all natives are citizens, except for by all natives we mean one member of a specific tribe, and by that one tribe we mean people who live on the specific street that this one family lives on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It was nothing. Yeah, yeah, and the thing is, like, the Pied Noir even revolted against the military rule at the time. They wanted more rights, and they felt they were getting restricted. But then... But let's not take it away. They vehemently disliked the natives because they did not want to lose their number one status. And even with the shot down Blum Violet Bill, there were other instances of trying to attain assimilation. But the thing is, the Pied Noir lobbies would always rig the elections. 
there is a point, and it's not just in this instance, the Algerians were fucked over after World War II. And David, can you explain this also? Yeah, it's unfortunately just a really common thing you see around World War II, where a lot of the colonized subjects of Britain and France and others fighting on the side of the Allies, you know, against fascism for freedom, fought bravely alongside the Allies during World War II, but then got completely neglected, completely looked over in its aftermath. Not as bad as World War I. Oh, World War I, terrible. And in a lot of ways, those disappointments set up a lot of anti-colonial struggles. Let's both the way. Disappointment set up for even more disappointment. Yeah. If you want to know more what I'm talking about, just look at what the British did to the Palestinians post-World War I. Spoiler alert, does not end well. The Balfour Declaration. So, Algeria, again, is essentially a case study of this. They fought for Vichy France. They also fought for the Free French Movement. Oh, uh, just a quick side note. Vichy France is the Nazi puppet government in southern France after the Nazis greet the French in France. Yeah, they're fighting for France. And, of course, they're fighting with this implied idea that they might get some expanded set of rights. Ideally independence, but at least something. But, of course, that did not happen at all. And this prompted a lot of independence leaders to create a charter called the Manifesto of the Algerian People. So a quote from it is, The French colony only admits equality with Muslim Algeria on one level, sacrifice on the battlefields. So they created the sort of seeds of what would become the struggle for independence. And just kind of a reminder here, a lot of anti-colonial resistance movements were communists because communists were generally the most sympathetic to anti-colonial struggles, while capitalist countries tended to be more supportive of colonization. Nick actually did a good job of mentioning this with World War I, because after World War I, a lot of countries came to the U.S., specifically President Wilson, because the U.S. was known for the value of self-determination. And when Wilson essentially ignored every single person who wasn't white, basically, a lot of them then turned over to Lenin and became Marxist Leninists. Again, remember, it was the U.S.'s fault for creating all of their enemies post-World War II because all they had to do was fucking listen. All they had to do. And we're going to hit the powder keg moment of this revolution and this independence movement where it starts to become violent. We're going to talk about the massacres at Satif and Guelma. And this was at the end of World War II. So this was the day when the Nazis surrendered, May 8th, 1945. 4,000 natives of the area show up to it. But well, under the orders of French high command, they were ordered to fire upon protesters and on the same day, they killed a lot of them in Guelma as well. By May 22nd, 45,000 Algerians perished as a result of these massacres. Well, these, it was not one day. It was from May 8th to May 22nd, and the French had no mercy against the protesters in Algeria. And then you started to see a rise in nationalism. Yeah, I mean, when you massacre people after... What was already a traumatic war that was supposedly fought for liberation, th the mask is off. Yeah, at this point, you're just not. You're a hypocrite at that point. Yeah. And here's the thing. When the French claim that Algeria is France, Algerie Française, they're going to try to do everything they can to keep things the way they are. But with the Pied Noir lobby rigging elections and blocking paths for native Berbers and Muslims to gain independence in the country, we see the creation of the FLN, which is the National Liberation Front. This will be the home team for the Algerians against the French in the war. They thought that violence was the only way to achieve independence because they saw all of these quote-unquote proper channels movements fall flat on their faces. I mean, they just watched a bunch of their people get massacred. Of course, the French are going to be totally up to discussing the suit. And totally, the, yeah. Totally reasonable, neutral arbitration. The ironic thing is that like, the French ended up giving t Morocco and Tunisia their own independence. They were in this kind of like hypocritical mode where they were pro-progress, but then 
we still want to keep our colonial prestige. I'm sure. I'm, and I'm sure that it's probably not helping that it's also not going very well in Vietnam either. And so I'm going to read an excerpt from their charter. That one did write a charter. And to the Algerian people, militants of the national cause, after decades of struggle, the national movement has reached its final phase of fulfillment. A group of young people dedicated and dedicated militants gathering about it, the majority of wholesome and resolute elements, has judged that the moment has come to take the national movement out of impasse into which has been forced by conflicts of person and influence and to launch itself into the true revolutionary struggle at the side of Moroccan and Tunisian brothers. So this is a little bit before Morocco and Tunisia gained their independence from France. Our movement of regeneration presents itself under the label of goal. National independence presents itself under the label of goal. National independence through the restoration of the Algerian state, sovereign, democratic, and social, and within the framework of the principles of Islam, and two, the preservation of the fundamental freedoms with distinction of a race or religion, end quote. So the war, quote-unquote, kicks off. And so you have the All Saints Day operation where you have a small group of Ephelin carrying out attacks across Algeria. In Iran, two farms were targeted, crops were burned, telephone wires were cut, and Algiers bombs exploded near a radio station. And there was also a group of French tourists who were shot at a bus. They were wounded. Here's the thing. We say it's a war of independence now, but... France never really declared war. Yeah, they basically saw it as preserving national sovereignty. And so they didn't declare it a war because they didn't see it as a war. They called it maintenance of order, which is very interesting. And this goes to the greater lie of colonization generally around this time. Looking back at the declaration of the FLN, right, you see where it says the restoration of the Algerian state, sovereign, democratic, and social The preservation of fundamental freedoms without distinction of race or religion. That sounds like democracy to me, right? That sounds like the values that the quote-unquote West says that it stands for. But when the question is between the values they say they stand for versus the material gains of colonial exploitation, they go with the exploitation and they don't even call it a war. Also, if you call it a war, you have to follow certain rules. And what Nick said previously in the episode, the Geneva Convention. You have to you have to follow the rules set by the Geneva Convention if you call it a war. However, if you just call it internal maintenance, you can go wild. So the Arabs and the Berbers, according to the French, were outside of the law. To them, they can do whatever they want. And so there was another big moment at the start of this war, the Philippeville Massacre. So... You had a group of FLN, or group of Muslim fighters. They did shoot on a group of Pied Noir, but they were stopped. But here's the thing. The Pied Noir also went on a murdering rampage with the French army and police looking on and doing nothing later. This is kind of like a really crazy scene. So you had Pied Noir walking up to bridges and hills and watching the massacre go on with like hot dog vendors and shit. Sort of like the way racist white people in the South had picnics about lynchings. Yeah, it was literally like something out of the South and even like some sort of like Roman gladiatorial combat stuff. Or hell that shit that they did when like the Civil War started. Yes. Oh, we're going to go watch battles. Something really perverse and gross about, oh, hey, do you want to go watch people get shot? Yeah, just the level of dehumanization that you need to make massacres and horrific violence A spectator sport. Yeah, I'm looking at you people who willingly go watch executions. Yeah, and so with Muslim Berber fighters shooting on the Pied Noir and the French military doing something, but when the Pied Noir do it, the French like, no, we don't care. Let them die. Let them die. That's basically just Algerians doing it to Algerians. And so the FLN were able to show the world that the French were irredeemably racist. Shocking. Gasp. There is a permanent split as a result between the Muslim and the Pied Noir populations. And a lot of French political people, political minds, including Pierre Mendes France, who was pivotal in the the Geneva Conference in 1954 over the loss of French colonial Indochina, he thought it was unheard of. Algeria is France. And who amongst you, mesdames and messieurs, 
would hesitate to employ all methods to preserve France. So this was the mentality of the higher ups in government. Do anything you can to stop them. Fucking talking about Alsace and Lorraine, okay? We're talking about a country that's like over there. Wait, did you say Alto Saxon Lorraine? No, Alsace and Lorraine. Uh, oh, Al- <laughs> we're not talking about like that area that Germany and France have fought for forever because yeah, it's right on the border. Like you have to go over water to get to fucking Algeria. Yeah, if you have to go over a sea and, and the people in that area don't want you there, it's not your country, no. dude. Yeah, it's it's like what makes me like, yeah, I'm just gonna park my slab up here and say, Hey, we don't want you here. It's like what are you going to do about it? But it's just like you're already the away team in the home ground and you're trying to create the rules. No, it's just not gonna work. But then you had the FLN, you know, making actually going across the world going through the Maghreb through Tunisia and into Egypt, because Ahmed Ben Bella is trying to get some deals done. And he's getting deals done with a very secularist revolutionary in Gamal Abdel Nasser. So he's trying to secure weapons to the FLN, which happens, which works, because Abdel Nasser does well in the Suez Canal crisis, which we'll talk about way later. But then there's also a big conference that happens. It's called the Bangdoon Conference. So the Bangdoon Conference happens April 4th, 1955. The day after my birthday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the FLN get an invite to the Bandun Conference, which is a conference of different Asian and African countries looking to forge a coordinated movement of the global South against colonialism and neocolonialism. Unfortunately, Algeria, technically not its own country, could only attend as an unofficial delegate. But the Egyptian delegates set forth a motion declaring uh, Algeria's right to independence, which the people or the representatives at the Bangdun conference did pass. The Algerian delegates gained pledges and vast sums of money. The delegates there had a conversation with Ho Chi Minh himself, and he said, Ah, les Français, that's a problem we know well, because, of course, around the same time, the Vietnamese had just declared independence from the French. But, of course, that came with an asterisk because the U.S. then took over the imperial duties of suppressing the it Vietnamese. Was, it was passing over the, the El Baton. Oh, gosh, man. I just, <laughs> I just can't imagine getting... I just can't imagine. the. Again, we talked about this in our episodes. So I won't labor on this, but just seeing how much more the Vietnamese wanted it and the U.S. going, no, nah, we're going to... We think we can do something about that. Oh, yeah. The Vietnamese wanted it more. They wanted it more against the French. And then against the Japanese, and then against the French again, and then against the Americans. You no, see, you see this all the time in like any sport. And I hate comparing these things to sports, but you can just see when an opponent wants it more. Yeah, damn, it's almost like people want control over their own resources and and land and even themselves. And also, the road to the United Nations was finally open. You know, I said we we're going to talk about the Suez Crisis way later. That's now. Well, that's that's now. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's been a long it's, three minutes. It's, it's been a long three minutes, and so. Let's put it this way. So there is a crisis in the Suez Canal, not because a ship is stuck horizontally. (laughs) (laughs) I I wonder if the memes back then about that Suez crisis were as good as the memes for this one were. Well, modern problems require ancient solutions, so they just just go on the Cape of Good Hope to figure something out. (laughs) South Africa's just like, dude, we are fucking killing it right now. We're back in business, boys. (laughs) This is what happens when you try to make things too easy. So the thing is, they find out that France enters this crisis because they believe Nasser was funneling weapons to the FLN, which was totes true. <laughs> <laughs> it was true, but also, I don't know, France, go fuck yourself. Yeah, right? It's like, oh, you mean Nasser is giving weapons to a people who want determination over themselves, their labor, their resources, their land? Oh, no, how terrible. And so French ships stop a ship <laughs> called the Athos and find tons of weapons on board. The biggest arms shipment the FLN was going to receive, and it was sent from Egypt. No coincidence at all. (laughs) I mean, they found weapons. Could they really determine where they were going, really? Yeah. And and so by sticking to NATO, so Guy Malay, who was the prime minister at the time, thought they would get aid from the U.S., but it didn't come. (laughs) Yeah. Actually, as a quick side note, as someone who thinks that Eisenhower, I mean the U.S. in general, but Eisenhower in particular had horrible foreign policy, in large part thanks to the Dulles brothers, who we've talked about on A Mouthful of History before. The, the Mouthful of History's unofficial mascot. Yeah, exactly. Just these goblinous, evil shitheads that headed the CIA and State Department. As someone who generally thinks that foreign policy apparatus was just abysmal, 
this was the one good thing they did where they came on the side of Egypt over France, Britain, and Israel. Well, because they didn't want, they knew the Soviet Union was going to get involved because Nasser was, now, what do you say be in negotiations with the USSR or were he was trying to cozy up like relations with the Soviet Union? It's a rare win for the U.S. foreign policy department. So, the, the right. Funny, the funny thing is France eventually leaves NATO because of this because they realized that the U.S. was not going to be on their side. By, and so Egypt came out on top, providing more arms to the FLN. France and England truly did lose their superpower status because the U.S. didn't help them. So, <laughs> and, and so Guy Malay couldn't get the military victory in Algeria that he wanted. And the violence to the FLN escalated because of the Ambien Fu. And so this was kind of a byproduct of that and trying to get more arms shipments. Malay eventually steps down because that was a debacle and just... They're trying to find this interlocutor valab, which is this third force for negotiations for Algeria. They don't want to negotiate directly with the FLN. But with the violence ramping up, the FLN do something that was definitely unheard of, and guerrilla warfare goes urban in the battle we call the Battle of Algiers. And if you want to hear more about this, listen to our final movie review of last season. But we'll give you a general summary of the conflict. If you want to know more, you can go into our movie review because the movie was created in 1966. Algerians got independence in 62. So that's four years removed. And they use actual people from the conflict to dictate how the movie was created and driven. Yeah. And in the episode two, we talk about the movie, but we do also connect it to the actual battle. So you'll get a pretty good overview of it over there i think we are going to however give a little bit of a refresher on that plus a little bit of extra detail didn't go into the movie review so the battle of algiers was a literal french victory on paper but the algerians and the fln won the war of popular opinion over the use of torture but we're going to talk about that in a few minutes this was the biggest turning point of the war despite being a loss to the fln so a guy who is named Ramdanaban, who is kind of like the muscle behind the FLN as it started to go on early, he thought it'd be their Dien Bien Phu because they had just seen the Vietnamese kick the French out of Indochina. This is one of his quotes. We kill hundreds of colonial soldiers and still not get publicly recognized. So he wanted to publicize this conflict to the world. And partly the Bang Dung Conference did that, but he wanted to get it escalated in terms of public perception so you had a guy named Saudi Yasef who is Jafar in the movie he called upon fighters to do guerrilla warfare tactics even women and so there are a few women Hasiba Bimboule Jamila Buaza Jamila Buhird who is a been a very big trial that Simone de Beauvoir was like a very vocal person for and Zora Drift and Samia Lakdari and these women wanted to fight contrary to what the French believed that Algerian women were repressed Women and, can't want to fight on their own. Clearly, they're being manipulated. Yeah, women don't ever want, like, total control of their country, too, right? And Zorha Drift explained, quote, They suggested that I work with the families of the prisoners, but I wanted to participate directly in armed conflict. I thought I would only be used as a nurse or secretary in the Maquis. I wanted to work with a terrorist group here in Algiers. So, these women wanted to do it. So there were three bombs that went off and killed a lot of Algerians on top of Pied Noir as well. And then the French 10th Paratroop Division led by Jacques Massou comes in to try to stop this. And so while violence is good, you also need a non-violence as well. And so there was also a general strike that happened. Yeah, and the whole idea behind the general strike is Algerians knew how much it would hurt the French to go on a massive strike. Because at the end of the day, a huge benefit of colonization for the colonizers is they exploit the labor and resources of the colonized people and the colonized lands, right? Of course, again, as we've already touched on, there's this colonial myth that colonization benefits the colonized. But when it comes down to it, even they know it's not true. And so the general strike is there to show that the real people profiting off of all of this were the French 
and the Algerians were going to make a stand. You mean the colonizers lied about their motives for their own benefit and to make themselves feel better? <sighs> I know, right? It's very hard to grasp, especially if you're a historian. That never happens. I know. This must be an anomaly in history, right, y'all? I mean, just knowing how, what the French did to stop the general strike was brutal. Brutal, right. And so, on that note, on the eighth day of the general strike, Masu, which, again, is the person basically in charge of the suppression of the Algerians, called in a division of troops and armored vehicles to stop the strike. They ripped open shop doors, even fired tank shells at them. Algerian sources accused the paratroopers of looting as well. Basically, just a, a bonanza of crime and violence against the people who were on strike. So then Yasef orders more bombings of the buildings, but make sure that very few, if no casualties, happen. Well, Yasef is the main man of, who's leading the FLN Algiers. So the thing is, the French wanted to stop it by any means necessary, and they used torture. There is no official order, but by any means necessary, nudge, nudge. Wink, wink. Wink, wink, double wink. Uh, that's actually blinking. Um, <laughs> this is this is actually this is exactly what we talked about about it not declaring it a war because when you declare something a war, you have rules. Torture is one of those things that is very very illegal by the Geneva Convention. Yep, but if you're doing it to your own population, all of a sudden it becomes a case of well they're doing it to themselves. Even if they're doing it to internally colonized folks. Yeah, you can't commit war crimes against yourself, apparently. One of the yeah. bi- and one of the biggest cases was also Jamila Buhird, who was tortured savagely by the French. And then you had Larabi Benhamidi, who was one of the Yosef's right-hand men. And he was arrested, but summarily executed near a barn. But Paul Asurez, who unrepentantly makes a book about admitting to torture said make it look like an accident this of course looks terrible for france throughout the rest of the world because you have some roman catholic priest speaking out against it you have a lot of soldiers too are speaking out against it and the popular opinion in france is like yo what are we doing like, and even we- more so in the rest of the world too and so the fln the algerian people got a victory in the popular front because of the use of torture by the French. Yeah, think but, of the Tet Offensive. We talked about this prior to recording. Think of the Tet Offensive. Basically a battle that, yeah, the colonizer won, but like in quotation marks they won. So Prime Minister Guy Malay falls because of, one, public opinion was against him due to the revealing of torture, and also finances. The war was draining France of its resources and money, so he steps down. And then another guy, Felix Gaillard, comes up and he goes and does the unthinkable and bombs Tunisia, the city of Sakyet, because French pursued alien fighters but bombed the village, killing 70, wounding 150. So France starts to lose allies. And to the Arabs and Muslims, it was Guernica. So he was deposed. Pierre Plimfin comes in and he wants to assimilate algerians but then some right-wing fuckers start to show up (laughs) and of course the pied noir who will never be happy with giving rights to algerians so you have pierre lagaillard who's a student leader from algiers university joseph ortiz cafe owner just you know uh, every war has it the collection of people who are just doing a little bit better than everybody else uh, they're willing to sell out their own people jean-jacques soussini who's a university student jean-baptiste biagi a gaullist resistance vent so they start to create groups like the FNF and FAF. People like these would invoke the May 1958 crisis. So this is over the French's problem with Algeria. And so the military believed that the French government was trying to give too much room for freedom for the Algerians. So General Raoul Salin and Massou, they essentially do a military coup. <laughs> And so there was a demonstration egged on by 100,000 Europeans. They ransacked government buildings, throwing out documents and typewriters from windows. This was turning into a shit show. So the military turns to who else to stir up national pride? Charles de Gaulle. Yeah, okay, quick side note. Charles de Gaulle was the leader of the Free French during World War II. He's a very revered figure. 
in France for basically being the face of French resistance during World War II. I personally find him to be a very overrated figure in the war's history, but we're not here for my personal opinion. Yeah, so de Gaulle put on this aura of reluctant dictator, you know? I don't want power for the sake of power. I'm only going to be here unless you let me. So Rene Coty, who was one of the high commanders of the French army in Indochina, he asked him to form a government. And so he does with Guy Mollet. He's back. And he got the support from the socialists. And so the Fourth Republic dies. And the Fifth Republic begins. Which I'm fairly confident is the current state of France, the Fifth Republic. Isn't it the Sixth Republic? I don't know anymore. And there's too many republics. Uh, it's There's always some landmark government thing happening. It's like a new iPhone. Yeah. And so what's the Gaulle stance on Algeria? It's a bit hazy. He sought to maintain French sovereignty by rejecting the 1947 statute. He also remembered the citizens' pro Vichy sentiments. On one hand, he tried to reject complete Algerian independence, but then also he tried getting on the pro Algerian side, but then also remembered, like, oh yeah, my citizens here are also racist too. Yeah, I'll say this for De Gaulle. One of the more intelligent leaders France has ever had, because at least he knows which way the wind is blowing and which way he should go with that stuff. And so initially he goes to the Pied Noir and other whites who live in Algeria and says, Je vous ai compris, means I have understood you completely. Quote, I know what has occurred to me. I see what you have sought to accomplish. I see that the road you have is that of renewal and fraternity. I say renewal in every aspect, but very rightly, you wanted to begin at the beginning. And that is with our institutions. And that is why I'm here. Say fraternity, for you will provide magnificent example of men who share the same ardor and live hand in hand. De Gaulle later stated, we'll see how to do the rest. It's a very vague statement. And he sought to open the door for reconciliation. I felt how beautiful, how great and generous France is. Vive la République, vive la France. Dude, you could totally see like a Pete Buttigieg making a speech like this. Oh my God, totally, right? Well, it's like, first of all, he wanted to appease the military. He wanted to appease the Pied de Mort. It's like, I've understood you, yada, yada, yada. You know, I'm on your side. And then also try to be on the side of the Algerians at the same time. So de Gaulle is going to become the main player. And so we're going to go into more detail about de Gaulle and what he does in Algeria in the next episode. So I just want to say thank you for hanging around while we were trying to put this all together. I know it's been a while. We promise we will never go five months without recording ever again. Yeah, we had a lot on our plates Nick and his wife, Caroline, also moved in with me and my wife, Kat. Side note, feels weird to say wife. And I say that because I just got married this last weekend. So we have had a lot of things uh, going on in our lives these last couple of months. And then again, uh, we had recorded anyway, but the recordings got lost. So it's been a mess. But like Nick said, we will absolutely never go this long without recording again. So thank you for bearing with us. The show will go on. So... Of course, we wanted to thank especially our Patreons who have been kind enough to support this podcast through Patreon. So shout out to Estefania. Really appreciate you. Uh, my mom, Sonia. Uh, to Zakia, Ben, Gio Franco, Alex, which is uh, Cameron's brother, and then Lene. So we really appreciate it. Thank you all for uh, you know giving what you can. For those of you who are listening... We do have a Patreon, which you can basically give uh, monthly donations to your favorite content creators for. Uh, for us, we have three tiers of $1 a month, $5 a month, and $8 a month that you can give. And uh, all of those help immensely. And each one comes with its own sort of set of perks. Yeah. And that will um, that's paused at the moment. We paused it when we realized we couldn't do episodes as frequently as we'd like to. That will be restarting back in June. Yes, although just so y'all know, uh, one of the benefits are monthly book reviews. I've mostly kept up with those. I think I do need to record my latest one, but uh, generally it, it is on pause. But if you do look into it now, uh, you'll at least have some things uh, available still. Yeah, of course, what David said, according to Tears, you can also help us contribute to an episode. You can play video games with us. And so Nick is totally going to get a... See if he can get a bunch of people who listen to our podcast and play Civ. I mean, we can get some Hearts of Iron going. I know my I know my friend Geo plays Hearts of Iron. It's another strategy game. 
So um, be on the lookout for that. We will be picking up on that. Like I said, it's a little more settled now, so we can actually do stuff like that that we really want to do. So thank you for your support. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, like I said, for hang- for waiting for us to come back. And we can't wait to give you more episodes. You know it. Thanks again, everyone. Good night. Good night.